Picking things up after last week's episode was rough, y'all. But after that cliffhanger of an ending in Chapter 5 of Infinity Train Book 3, I couldn't wait to watch the next batch to find out what happens next. Simon and Grace discover some major secrets about the true conductor that threatened to tear the apex apart and put Hazel's life in danger. I'm Whitney Van Lanningham, and today we're breaking down chapters 6 through 8 of Infinity Train Book 3. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our super nerd sponsor of the day, Lauren Linton, for supporting us on Patreon. Spoiler alert! This video contains major spoilers for all eight episodes of season three so far. And if you haven't caught up on one through eight, you might want to pause this video and take care of that before you party on. And once again, please, please, please support this show on HBO Max. If you want a book four or a book five, HBO needs to see those views. I don't know about you guys, but I don't think any mid-season cartoon episode has ever wrecked me like this one did. Even though we know Owen Dennis has absolutely zero problem killing his characters, I was still holding out for hope that because Tuba's death was off screen, she'd somehow miraculously pull through. So many horror movies do that, and I thought that maybe Owen would do what he did with Atticus in season one and bring Tuba back to life. But even though I was trying to stay optimistic, picturing Tuba landing softly on the back of a gome and being gently transported to the next platform, Chapter 6 confirmed that she is actually dead dead. Hazel doesn't have long to plead for Tuba to come back. She's in full turtle mode, and she has no idea how she got like this. Based on her reaction, it's safe to say that this is the first time she's morphed, and that has to be extra terrifying after losing your only caretaker and comforter. Terrified that Simon will kill her, Hazel starts crying so Grace promises that they just won't tell Simon that she's an Animorph. But honestly, I think that Hazel has every right to be terrified of both him and Grace. Even though Grace wouldn't have killed Tuba, Hazel still knows that Grace didn't consider her a person based on her feelings about other Nulls, and it's heartbreaking that she has to experience major emotional and physical changes, as well as remain terrified that she'll be thrown to the wheels at any moment by the two people currently looking after her. Although neither of them are safe, Hazel clings to Grace because at least Grace is empathetic enough to know that you can't be so blunt with a six-year-old. Simon obviously could care less. He spends the entire trek through the campfire car complaining that Tuba didn't matter because she wasn't really a person. Despite Simon's heartlessness, Hazel stands her ground and insists on having a funeral for Tuba. Hazel decides to use the glowing stone that Tuba packed carefully away in their bag before they left the jungle car to symbolize her best friend. Grace and Hazel climbed to the top of a tall tree to say a few words about Tuba. Even though Grace had complicated feelings about Nulls, she managed to dig deep in her heart and find the things that she truly appreciated about Tuba. She cries with Hazel during the funeral, which is huge for her character. Hazel always has to appear tough, because she has the highest number and a reputation to protect. But in this moment, she actually allowed herself to be human and feel her feelings. And seeing Hazel in mourning brings her closer to realizing that denizens are real, and they're capable of human emotions and deserving of basic decency. Hazel sings the beautiful lullaby that Tuba wrote for her daughter and often sang to her as well. If you made it through that entire song without crying, congratulations, your antidepressants are working. Hazel tells the glowing Tuba rock that she'll always love her like she's still here and places it inside the tree where it goes dark. I'm really interested to find out more about this rock, but I'm not sure that it'll be important in future seasons. If you remember episode two, the jungle car had that same rainbowy glow all around, and it seemed to follow Tuba and Hazel. I wonder if that rock actually had any supernatural powers, or if Hazel just liked it because it made for a pretty nightlight. Either way, it was a really lovely tribute to Tuba, and even though it broke my heart, it was comforting to think about her being reunited with Bugle in the afterlife. Tuba made Hazel feel warm and loved, and Hazel vows to be that same light in the world now that she's gone. Honestly, this scene makes this one of the best episodes of Infinity Train ever, and doesn't shy away from the emotional honesty both kids and parents need to see when dealing with grief. In fact, throughout these three episodes, we see Hazel go through the stages of grief. We see her shock and denial when she first tries to wrap her head around the reality that Tuba is gone, and then she immediately tries to bargain with Grace in an attempt to change the circumstances. Obviously, later we see her develop anger towards Simon, and in between all this, she has bouts of depression and moments of acceptance. What's interesting and cool is that Hazel doesn't feel the emotional states in any particular order, and even slides between them as she struggles with Tuba's death. In reality, the five stages of grief can be experienced in any order just like this, 
and the attention to Hazel's journey through this model just goes to show how human she is. Also, it's not just the writing that makes this episode so special. The animation throughout is spectacular. One of my favorite moments is when Hazel calms down from her panic attack, and her deep breathing slowly transforms her back into a human. The transition with every breath she takes is so smooth and powerful. And then there's the funeral itself, which was also breathtaking to say the least. Ah, uh, the show is so great. It is firing on all cylinders and I am here for it. While crossing the platform to the next car, they breeze past Amelia without even noticing in their hurry to find the rest of the apex. But when Amelia circles back to confront them, Grace and Simon realize that their number tracker wasn't locked onto the rest of their apex crew. It was coming from Amelia herself. This is a great reveal and basically confirms that Amelia has the number the size of a small army. Wild. Also, can we take a moment to respect how toned and buff Amelia is? 40 digit number or not, this gal can clearly hold her own in a brawl. Amelia explains that she's trying to track down an anomaly in one of the train cars that's making the cars it passes through eject themselves. Because it's not part of the train's actual code, Amelia needs to find it and correct it before the rest of these cars get ejected. In a twist that absolutely floors Grace and Simon, she also reveals that one one, or if she calls him one, doesn't even know the apex exists, as he recognizes all train passengers and denizens as a series of ones and zeros. So basically their whole mission is completely one-sided and unreciprocated. While they're out here trashing train cars to stick it to one one, one one is just keeping on without ever knowing who they are or what the apex stands for. Finding out that everything you've been fighting for is non-existent really has to blow. Here's a question I want to ask. Is there any significance behind Amelia referring to 1-1 one one as just 1? I normally would have overlooked it, assuming it was just a shortened version of his name, but both Amelia and the Apex members called attention to the differentiation multiple times. Grace asks her twice if she's referring to 1-1 one one when Amelia calls him 1 leading me to believe that Grace also isn't sure why she's calling him just one. I could totally be reading way too much into this, and it could just be a nickname. But let me know if you guys think they're discussing the name change multiple times means something more. Simon wants to stick around and talk to Amelia to hopefully get some answers about how to fix Grace's dwindling number. But Grace puts her foot down. She wants to make sure that nothing causes Hazel to morph in front of Simon. So she pulls rank and insists they make a run for it. She reminds him that the Apex doesn't trust adults, and he reluctantly agrees. Amelia wants them to stay so that she can figure out the glitch in the code, but the three make a run for it before she can ask more questions. They decide to set up camp in a nearby cave for the night, but when Simon gets aggressive with Grace about showing him her number, Hazel gets really upset and almost turtles out in front of him. Luckily, he decides to go outside and keep watch while they get some sleep. Little do they know, however, Simon sneaks off in the middle of the night to find the cat while everyone else is asleep. He bursts into her cabin in Le Chat Chalet car and starts demanding that she help him to make up for ditching him when he was a kid. She tries to explain that she thought Simon was right beside her as they fled the gums, but that when she realized he wasn't with her, she was already in the next car. Simon coldly responds that she never came looking for him afterwards, and she has to admit that he's right because that's just who she is, a coward. When he tells her that Amelia has surfaced and is trying to tell him and Grace all this wild stuff, the cat gets defensive and tells him that Amelia tried to kill her multiple times when she was the conductor. So now, Simon has even more backup proof that Amelia was their idea of the true conductor, but he still doesn't want to fully believe it. When he explains to the cat that Grace's number isn't working and that her numbers are going down, she asks him to think about why their numbers go up. She points out that the numbers go up every time he does something bad, like ransacking a train car. What do you think it means when someone's number declines? It's very clear that Simon really hasn't thought about this, and that if he has, he's in so much denial about the train's true purpose. Even if he knew deep down what this meant from the beginning, he'd still be lashing out like this because he's afraid of losing grace and losing their way of life in the apex. Think about all those cult leaders who tell their congregation that the world is gonna end. When the planet inevitably doesn't explode, those followers' worlds are rocked. Imagine basing your whole life around a belief system and having it come crashing down around you. He pleads with the cat to help him figure out what Grace is hiding from him and refers to her by her real name, Samantha. I honestly had no idea that the cat had a real name, but it makes sense that she would. All the other talking animal denizens do. The cat offers to give him access to Grace's memory tape to help him figure out why she doesn't want to find out more from Amelia. 
but warns him that getting lost in your own memory tape could be very dangerous. But ultimately, she's unable to stop him from going back to uncover Grace's memories. The next morning, Hazel and Grace wake up alone in the cave, and Hazel discovers that she can extract her turtle claws at will. Her arm is still pretty turtly from their blow up with Simon last night, and she's insistent on using her animal form to protect them from him. But Grace pleads with her to keep quiet about it until they can figure out what's going on. Just then, one of those flying golden snakes attacks the cave, but Amelia saves them. She promises them breakfast if they help her figure out what's going on with the ejecting train cars, and Hazel excitedly agrees. While serving them scrambled eggs, Grace notices that when Amelia says thank you to her for cooperating, the number on her neck goes down. Although she doesn't say it out loud, it's obvious that she's coming to the same realization that Simon just had with the cat, that your number decreases every time you work through your problems or do something kind for others. Amelia explains her backstory to Grace that when she first got on the train, she was in so much pain from losing Ulrich that she dedicated all of her time to trying to recreate her old life. In doing so, she created things that never should have been, and now she's trying her best to undo all the damage that she did when she was hurting. Simon returns and tries to attack Amelia, telling Grace that the cat told him she was dangerous. He accuses Amelia of stealing the Apex's symbol to wear around her belt in opposition to them, but she has no idea what he's talking about. She tells him that the squiggly line around her belt is the sine wave of her sound shield and bursts out laughing when she realizes that the Apex thought that she was the true conductor. She's like, nah, dog, you got this all wrong. I'm the false conductor and whips out her voice changer to prove it. Upon hearing the distorted voice of the conductor, Grace realizes that she heard the same voice on the day she arrived on the train. She assumed the conductor was a man because of the deep voice and she assumed that the red squiggles were just a cool part of their helmet. And of course this makes so much sense. Grace was a child and her first assumptions of how the train worked ultimately became her belief system. When she linked up with Simon, she told him the story, one kid to another, and he believed her because who else did he have? I'm sure both of them were terrified, looking for anything to fight for and trust in in their newfound world of uncertainty and chaos. The apex was a way for Grace and Simon to feel in control over their lives on the train, and they let it get totally out of hand by perpetuating their narrative. They brainwashed other kids on the train to follow them and truly believed that they were doing the right thing. But when you look at it from above, it's easy to see that this was a story that two scared kids told themselves and then told other scared kids who needed something to believe in. Grace decides that she feels neutral about Amelia, but she still hasn't made up her mind about fully buying into her story because she's held on to her own version of the truth for so many years. Simon still doesn't trust her at all, but when Amelia asks them to follow her to the next train car, Grace urges him to trust her. He admits that he saw Samantha, and Grace is upset with him for going back to her. Little does she know, Simon has everything he needs to take her down right in his pocket. Finally, Simon has the upper hand, and he's starting to get a taste for being number one. With Grace's number lowering and her memories at his mercy, it seems like Simon is slowly realizing that he doesn't need her to continue on the mission of the Apex. In the Hey Ho Whoa car, the gang has to regroup. This car has a bunch of little bits yelling, Hey Ho Whoa, falling from the ceiling into a deep pit. And when the pit fills up, they'll be able to get across to the next car. While they wait, Amelia tells her story, how she lost Ulrich and nearly drove herself and the entire train to ruin trying to get him back. After realizing that she'd never grow if she didn't start making amends, Amelia decided to work with one one to fix all of the cars she had messed up. She's hopeful that if she keeps reversing the damage she caused, she'll eventually lower her number enough to exit the train herself. Simon is completely outraged when he hears this. Even though the cat floated the idea by him, he now has confirmation from a second source that working on your problems lowers your number and in turn lets you leave the train. But the more Amelia and the cat revealed to him, the angrier and more confused he became. He feels like Amelia's truths are threatening his entire way of life and lashes out in anger because he's too scared to change. He attacks Amelia again, and she once again defeats him with her sound shield. Their fighting upsets Hazel, and before Amelia can put the smack down on Simon, she transforms into a turtle right in front of them. This is the part that felt really sucky. When Hazel is revealed to be a turtle person, Grace acts like she never even knew about it. She had an opportunity to redeem herself here, to stand up for Hazel and be another voice proving Simon wrong. Instead, she yells at Hazel and calls her a null when Simon suggests that they ditch her with Amelia. 
This is the final missing piece that Amelia was looking for, and everything clicks. Hazel is a product of her experiment to recreate Ulrich, and the closest she ever came to making a full human. That pesky turtle handkerchief slipped into the mix and turned her, and almost everything else Amelia touched, into a turtle. Hazel is the glitch in the code, and that's why she popped up on Amelia's tracker every time they passed through a new car. The number on Hazel's hand, 337, is the same number that Amelia had when she first boarded the train. But because she's technically a denizen, her number is inactive. Also, remember earlier in the episode when Hazel says Amelia makes great pancakes? Well, if you go back to Amelia's season one flashback episode, you'll see a quick frame of Ulrich making pancakes with her. This, along with her British accent, were all little clues that she was a version of Ulrich made by Amelia's hands. We gotta slow down for a second and talk about what this might mean for Hazel going forward. Amelia mentioned that she needed to fix the glitch in order to fix the train. But Hazel is so much more than just a messed up line of code. She's a real person with real feelings and a life. Amelia can't just destroy her. Regardless of anything the Apex thinks, Nulls and Denisons have lives filled with love and purpose and value. She can't delete Hazel. So what are they gonna do about her then? Presumably, they have to find a way to fix her code, but how? Amelia couldn't get the experiment right in the first place. How exactly will they fix her? Will they turn her into a full denizen like Lake or somehow make her a human? Both of those outcomes have major consequences for the real world. We now have Lake living on the outside, chrome body and all, but the creators haven't told us what happened to her. She's a teenager. Jesse and Tulip had homes and families to return to, but where would Lake go? Did Jesse's mom quickly become super cool with a metallic teenager moving into her house? Or was Lake forced to forge on her own in the human world? If Hazel is turned into another human, will she be given another number and allowed to grow as the train expects? Would she be able to eventually get off the train? If she did, where would she go? She doesn't have any other human friends at this point, so where would a six and a half year old even find a place to live? And even if they do make her into a full denizen, Lake proved that denizens should be given the opportunity to leave the train if they want to. Lake was fully humanoid in every way except for her physical form, and therefore able to grow, change, and make decisions for herself. Even if Hazel stays a denizen, she's still a sentient being. Isn't it her right to eventually leave the train if she chooses? I am definitely getting ahead of myself here with all these questions, and with only two episodes left, I wonder if we're going to address any of them this season. I'm dying to explore the ways in which humans and denizens are different, but also in the ways in which they're alike and able to make normal life decisions for themselves. This kind of philosophy is exactly the type of thing Infinity Train seeks to explore, so we have to find out what Amelia does to modify Hazel's code. Anyway, back to the story. Hazel asks Grace if she's really going to leave her alone, and Grace softens. She's caught between a rock and a hard place here. If she comforts Hazel, Simon will know that she's grown attached to the Null, but if she sides with Simon, Hazel will never trust her again. She's able to talk him into staying for one more night, but he's already on to her. When everyone falls asleep, Simon pours the tube of 1-1 lice onto the top of Grace's head. They begin pulling her memory tape out in ribbons, which Simon hooks up to the projector to watch. He replays the memory of Grace finding out that Hazel is part turtle, where she reassures her that she won't say anything to Simon about her condition. The last thing we see before the credits is Simon replaying her betrayal over and over in the dark. Wow, man, Simon is absolutely about to crack. Not only is everything he held true a lie, the person he respected and trusted most in the world is breaking their sacred code. The next two episode descriptions indicate that the gang will link up again with the Apex, and I predict that there's gonna be a battle over Hazel's life. Simon has already proven that he'll kill any Null with zero remorse. Will he and the Apex try to throw Hazel to the wheels like he did to Tuba? As of right now, Simon is looking like a pretty irredeemable character. Where Grace is open to questioning the falsehoods of her past and learning from them, Simon outright rejects them and firmly jabs his head back into the sand. Unless he has a major change of heart in the last two episodes, I don't see how Simon is going to get back on the good side, which I think means he probably won't. At this point, I can honestly see him trying to kill Grace, Hazel, Amelia, or all three. And with the help of the Apex, he'll be pretty unstoppable. That being said, I do think that there's hope for Grace. Even though she pussed out and didn't stand up to Simon in Chapter 8, she clearly cares for Hazel. And I have a hard time believing that she'll be able to throw her off the side of a train, even if Simon tells her to. If anything, I could foresee her potentially sacrificing herself for Hazel. 
maybe pushing Hazel out of the way as Simon tries to wheel her. This act could be selfless enough to lower her number to zero and open her exit door off the train mid-fall. The episode descriptions also say that these secrets will be revealed to the Apex in episode 9, and that what they learn will cause a major reordering within their group. This could really go either way. The kids could completely latch on to Simon as their new leader, or they could follow Grace and try to learn from their past mistakes. My guess is that the rest of the Apex will have to decide who they follow from now on, and perhaps they'll even split into two separate groups going forward. Wow, you guys, it really feels like there's a lot to wrap up in the last two episodes, and I want to know what you guys think is going to happen in the comments. Will Simon and Grace ever redeem themselves? Is Simon going to try to kill Hazel? Will Amelia be able to fix Hazel's code? Let me know in the comments below, like and subscribe to Nerdwire, and I'll be back next week to talk about the series finale of Infinity Train, Cult of the Conductor.